Habakkuk chapter 2. I'll read this one today. It's not very long. It's <coughs> today. One through three. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he shall say to me. And what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for a point of time. But at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Just get a little, get a little background, remind you of what all we talked about so far. That'll help me see what I need to see. so far has been God, just how long must I endure the pain of watching these people sin? God's answer was, just watch what I'm about to do. You're not going to believe it. But I'm getting somebody that's nasty, sinful people ready to pass judgment on my people. But God, how could you How can you use someone that is worse than we are to pass judgment on us? You can't stand presence in your sin in your presence. So why are you using someone that's more of a sinner than I am to punish me, to correct me? He says, you are too just to tolerate evil. You are unable to condone wrongdoing. So why do you put up with such treacherous people? Why do you say nothing when the wicked devour, devour those more righteous than we are? Then Habakkuk does something very intentional. He is intentional in seeking the presence of God. He is intentional in making sure that he is in a position to receive the answers he is looking for. All the while knowing that his understanding of the will of God comes only when he is open to listening to what God has to say. Be still and know that I am God. He is open to being corrected in his understanding. And Psalms 119 verse 2 says, Blessed are those who keep His laws, those who seek Him with the whole heart. Here's my heart. Here's my life. My will. Show me and guide my thinking in the way of righteousness. When we're in intentional and seeking God, it becomes easier not to only understand, but to keep God's will. To do His, do His will. To stay within His laws. 
I don't know how many have taken Psalms 119 and studied it. To see what it's all about. Yeah, I know it's the longest book in the Bible. It has 176 verses in it. I haven't tackled it in a series. So we might be there two years. There's a lot of things in Psalms 119. It's talking about God. It's talking to God. And telling Him, I don't fully understand your ways. I don't understand the things that you do. Or why you allow some of the things to go on in my life. But it says, help me God. Help me to trust in your ways. I do understand when I come to you and seek you with my whole heart, you will return to me the righteousness and the love. So Habakkuk goes and makes himself comfy. He says, okay, God, I'm ready. Lay it on me. I gave you my thoughts, and I know I'm probably going to be wrong. But lay it on me. God says, okay, here it is. But I want you to write down the vision you see. Make sure you use good penmanship because I want others to be able to read it. And also use words that are easily understood because I want people to be able to grasp the meaning of what I'm about to tell you. Make it so it can be easily spread to others. If you study scripture any, you will discover that this theme is carried clear through the Bible. When you really be intentional in seeking God while reading the scriptures and are open to listening, it becomes easy to understand scriptures. What does 2 Timothy 3 tell us? Verses 16 and 17. Every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the person dedicated to God may be complete and equipped for every good work. How can scripture do its work? If you don't understand it. How can scripture do its work. If you don't take time. To listen for the Holy Spirit to show you. To tell you. To reveal the scripture to you. If you don't take the time to read the scripture. God's desire for his people. Is to love trust, and obey. He wants his people to know he is watching over them like a mother hen watches and protects her chicks. What was it that Jesus said to Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you under my wings. That wasn't just in that moment. It was way back in the Old Testament. Did you know that when you start searching for evidence of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, you will find him? If you take verse 3, it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. What vision is he talking about? The time is not yet, but it is coming. 
Was he talking about Judea and the fall of Jerusalem? The annihilation of the temple? Or if you study scripture in, in Isaiah and in Hebrews, it references this verse when it's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go down that, that road, but it's there. God wants us to be able to understand His Word so that we can trust and obey Him. God needs us to understand His Word because if we don't, we can't protect ourselves from the evil in this world. We need to be able to put on the whole armor of God. Which is what? It's the Scriptures. It's the Bible. It's God's Word. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Which is the Word of God. Which you will find in Ephesians 6. When it comes right down to it, if you put yourself in a position to listen, the Holy Spirit will reveal the Scripture to you. And the Scriptures won't just be a word salad. They won't just be a bunch of words strung together, not really meaning anything. How many times have you heard someone speaking on a subject when they're asked a question, they just give you a bunch of words which didn't tell you a thing. We need to take the time, be intentional in putting ourselves in a position to be able to hear the Word of God, to be hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us when we're reading Scripture. God told the prophet Write down the stuff you see in this vision. Make sure it's plain English so that future generations can read it and understand it. But we have to do due diligence in reading and listening to what the Holy Spirit has to say. God says, wait for it. The time is not now, but it's coming. It will come at a point in time. You may think it's a long time, but wait for it, because it will come when I decide it's time. Be patient. My timing is not the same as your timing. And I know, I've heard it said different times, I'm not going to pray for patience again. But we are told to be patient. To wait for it. Have you ever looked through Scripture to see if there's any benefit in waiting on the Lord? Psalms 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Lamentations 3, verses 25 and 6. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you have the patience to quietly sit and wait for God to speak to you? Have you put yourself in a position where you can quietly wait and watch for the response of God when you ask Him for something? Isaiah 30, verses 18 and 19. Therefore the Lord will wait. Here 
God is waiting on us. Why would he wait for us? I saw a response. That he may be gracious to you. If we're not willing to wait, why should God wait for us? To decide that we want to hear something from him. It's our choice to sit down and quietly wait for him to talk to us, to respond to us when we ask him for something. God is waiting for us to do that. How effective is it to tell a five-year-old to do something, to behave himself, when he's not listening? When he's off over here doing something? It's not very effective. How often have you seen a parent trying to straighten a child up that the child is completely ignoring them? Does it work? No. So why would it work indefinitely when we're not willing to listen to God when He responds to us when He's trying to tell us something? And therefore He will be exalted that He may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion of Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. He is waiting for us to turn to him and spill our guts. To pour out what's in our souls, in our hearts. He is waiting. All we have to do to decide is to, hey Lord, I need help here. Sit down and listen. Pay attention. Psalms 37, verse 7. Rest in the presence of the Lord. And wait patiently for Him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He guides me beside the still waters. Resting in the presence of the Lord. Waiting patiently. For God to do his thing when we ask him for something. Don't worry about the evil people around you. Don't worry about that sinner that told you if you were a good Christian, you wouldn't do that. Don't worry about that guy that's got everything, more than he can handle, more than he knows what to do with but still living in sin. Their reward is coming. They have their riches now, but the time is coming when they will lose it all. How many U-Hauls and armored money trucks have you seen fall on the hearse? Not a one. They don't take nothing with them. You will not take nothing with you. I will not take anything with me. So don't worry about it. Don't worry. Be happy. It's an old song. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In Luke 16. Get serious here. <laughs> In Luke 16, verses 19 to 31, is the account of the rich man and the beggar, Lazarus. The beggar lay at the rich man's door, hoping to get a few crumbs off his table. 
Apparently, the rich man didn't give him any. It doesn't tell us if he did or not. But they both died. Have you ever noticed what happened to the both of them when they died? The beggar is carried away by angels. What happened to the rich man? He just said he was buried. There's nothing glorious about that. He dug a hole and put him in and covered him over. The beggar. He got his reward. He was carried off with angels. That's how I plan on leaving this world. Be escorted out here by angels. The rich man was in the flames of hell. And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. The rich man calls out, says, hey, have Lazarus come and dip his finger in cold water and put some on his tongue to cool it. Now imagine this. When you picture a poor old beggar, what do you picture? Somebody that's grungy, dirty? What would you think his hands looked like? Probably hadn't had a bath in how many years? What's his hands look like? And the rich man is asking him to dip his finger in water and drip it on his tongue. How desperate are you for a cold drink? Can you imagine what his fingers look like? And he wants some water off them fingers. Doesn't sound like it's very fun in hell. But Abraham said, not so fast. You had your riches and good life before you died. You didn't care about Jesus Christ. You didn't care about what God had to say. But Lazarus had his miserable life. On earth. Well, now both of you are getting your just rewards for your earthly life. The point is, don't be looking around at others, those around you who do not know Jesus. Yes, they may look like they have it all together. That life is one great big happy party. But what is it really like? I'm a people watcher. I watch people. They say the eyes are the, are the witness to the soul. How many filthy rich people have you seen and really looked in their eyes? see if there's truly happiness there or not. Do they have peace within their soul? Is there an element of joy that, ju that one just simply cannot understand even in times of hardship? The thing about thirsting for the riches of this world That thirst is never quenched. The feeling of satisfaction, that void that you're trying to feel and you had it filled with the latest, the best, and the newest of this world had to offer. That feeling will always slowly leak away. And then you have to refill it. Here in chapter 2, verse 5, indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. He does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire 
as hell. He is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. Then Proverbs 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. In Proverbs 30, 15 and 16, the leech has two daughters, give and give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Four never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire never says enough. The things of this world, you will never have enough. You will never have that satisfaction. Do you want a fat satisfaction that lasts forever? That never fades. Oh, to never hunger and thirst. Seek first the kingdom of God, and these will be added to you. Jesus says, even though heaven and earth are passing away, my word will never fade away. You want something that lasts forever? Check God's word. The things of this world will pass away. God's word is standing forever. Now, I like the way the Holy Spirit works. Because I'm going to finish off with something that uh, Gary said this morning. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. One needs to fill his, the void by drinking from the fountain of water that springs up and into everlasting life. We need to drink from the river of life that flows from under the throne of God. In John 4 and in Revelations 21 and 2. Jesus said, I am that well of everlasting life. That water that gives everlasting life. Do you want to be filled? Do you want love, grace, and mercy that God is waiting to give you? We must be intentional in seeking Him with our whole heart, our mind and soul. Go find that watchtower and wait for Him to speak to you. Find that perfect place where you can sit quietly and meditate on the Word of God, on Scripture, and then patiently listen. Wait for Him to speak. Expect Him to answer. Know that He will answer. When He hears your cry, He will answer. Be intentional in listening for the voice of God. You must expect Him to answer or you're going to miss it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for your promise of waiting for us to make that turn to you. So that when we cry to you, you will answer. You're waiting patiently for us to come to you and listen for what you have to tell us. Help us, Heavenly Father. Send the Holy Spirit to talk to us 
to dwell in our souls and our hearts so that we can turn to you and be prepared for what you have to tell us. Give us the courage to listen and to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.